The human brain is amazingly complex, but your better brain health could be shockingly simple. Dr. Cabran Chapik is with us from the Amen Clinic. Oh, my pleasure. Is that right, though? Is better brain health simple? Uh, it can be. Um, Although the brain, although it's your most complex organ, it needs a lot of good care to keep it healthy and working well for you. We're going to talk all, a lot about some of that care as well, but one of the things that you do at the Amen Clinic itself is you do a lot of brain scans. That's been like mm -hmm. a big thing since the right. start. What is yeah. that? Other specialists, uh, like gastroenterologists, look. They do colonoscopy and upper endoscopy. And so we have found that using imaging helps us understand what's going on with someone. Um, ultimately, it helps me be a better doctor because I ask questions that I may not have otherwise asked. I understood that the Amen Clinic was about brain health. And when I hear you talk about a psychiatrist, I'm thinking, okay, mm -hmm. why would a perfectly normal person, me, want to go <laughs> see a psychiatrist? When you, uh, as, as it brings back to the imaging piece, if we assess the brain, we can actually tell, um, uh, we can actually assess someone's brain where they're at um, and predict potential problems that could be coming down the pike. And we can optimize if there's areas that are low to improve performance. Mm -hmm. um, so performance enhancement. Thanks to uh, the Amen Clinic, I went ahead and went through with a brain scan. Tell us about what it was that I needed to do to be able to have the brain scan and then basically 15 mm -hmm. minutes later it was done. The scan is very simple. There's a small amount of radioactive isotope called technetium injected. Uh, you lie on a table, right, and the, mm -hmm. the camera spun around your head and sort of um, picked up brain activity. And we can tell from that what's overactive and what's underactive and what's working well. And it's, it's a different type of scan than an MRI or a CT, which is more of a structural, function, uh, structural scan. Mm -hmm. It's more of a functional scan. So dare I ask, I guess I might as well, mm -hmm. what did mine look like? Because we've got it up on the screen. <laughs> you have a beautiful brain. Oh. Your brain looked really healthy, but I did see some signs of past injury. Mm -hmm. um, and yep. so Play, I, played a lot of sports when I was younger. Played a lot of sports. So um, the scan is very sensitive at picking up past brain injury. Um, and you don't have to have lost uh, consciousness to have a concussion, or a, which is a type of mild brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can pick up dings along the way and we can see those. And uh, let me just ask this, would you recommend uh, brain scans for, for a lot of people? Uh, I, I like that you said a lot of people, not everyone, yes. I, I would recommend uh, brain imaging for most, um, at least adults and children and adolescents if they're having behavioral difficulties or uh, difficulties like ADD. Maybe it could be something like um, a colonoscopy at 50, you get your brain scan at, at 50 as well. Mm. Um, In today's world, we have a lot of PTSD. Um, and where we live in the Pacific Northwest, there are an awful lot of uh, returning military people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also traumatic brain injuries that I know that you've talked about as well. Um, is that the kind of thing that is predictive or can be assessed through brain scans? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you know, we actually did a, a study recently that looked at differentiating PTSD from TBI or traumatic brain injury. and. Um, we looked at 20,000 scans, so we have a database of over 100,000 scans now, so we're able to do this uh, research. Uh, it's very exciting. So we had uh, 20,000 um, patients and then 200, 200 of them were veterans. And that's because it's so common to have TBI or PTSD and the um, symptoms can overlap, like insomnia, depression, anxiety, problems focusing, but the treatment is vastly different. So Oftentimes for PTSD, the brain is overactive and we want to calm the brain. Whereas with TBI, it's a pattern of underactivity typically and we actually want to increase activity and healing for the brain. Um, and we were able to clearly differentiate the uh, differences between TBI and PTSD or if they had both, which many of the veterans do. This is a great time actually for you to describe the brain itself. And if you could do that, that would be that would mm -hmm. be very helpful to the audience. Your brain is actually as soft as butter and your skull is quite hard. And you can see on the inside that there are many sharp bony ridges uh, which can damage it if hit by, you know, it was not designed to be hit by soccer balls, playing football. 
um, rams and um, woodpeckers were, um, there's, they have built-in shock absorbers, but we don't. This is the frontal lobe, uh, which is involved in focus, concentration, um, organization, and uh, empathy. If we look at the underside of the brain, we can see uh, these other structures. So these are the temporal lobes involved in um, so where memories are stored. There's a small portion, the hippocampus, and um, this is the brain stem coming down. It regulates many of our automatic body processes um, that we don't have to consciously think about, breathing, digestion, things like that. This is your cerebellum in the back involved in um, uh, balance and coordination, and it's sort of like your automa automatic processing speed um, in like RAM in a computer. It sounds like that modern medicine of 2016 really has a far better handle on the brain and its functions and making it better than we did just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Is that largely because of these scans? Um, I think that we are Still, in many ways, we don't know a lot about the brain, but we're beginning to understand much, much more. Um, and I think imaging is playing a huge role in that. Uh, not only SPECT, but also fMRI um, and other types of imaging, including QEEG, which is looking at the electrical activity of the brain. And I think the next step is going to be combining multiple um, types of assessment and putting them together. Um, actually, we want to do that uh, at some point and include the volumetric MRI with SPECT imaging, with QEEG. That's something we're working on. And the Amon Clinics, there's several around the United States. Right. So we're in Bellevue, Washington. There's the New York Clinic. Um, so basically three on the East Coast, three on the West Coast. Yeah. You've also worked in concert with UCLA. Dr. Dale Bredesen is a neurologist um, at the Buck Institute. He's also a researcher at UCLA, and he's just been a, a, a neurologist doing research in the lab on aging and Alzheimer's disease. However, uh, working 27 years, in the past few years, uh, he's developed and come up with some discoveries about um, new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And, um, you know, Alzheimer's is typically thought of now that it's, it's uncurable, it's not even preventable, and there's really no treatments that work. Um, but he's, I think, begun to crack the code on that as far as uh, treatment. And really the problem has been that there isn't one single drug treatment for Alzheimer's, that, that each uh, researcher has found one element of that but he's putting together more of a programmatic approach, which is what we do at the Amen Clinics as well, is to look at all aspects of someone. You know, as far as treatment, we want to look at what they're eating, their exercise, look at deficiencies or toxicity. And if you put all of those pieces together, there's much more likelihood of um, success and improvement. And he's actually been able to publish and show reversal of cognitive decline Okay, let's. I gotta okay. interrupt you there. Re yeah. Reversal of cognitive decline. That mm -hmm. sounds like a good thing. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. So um, these are patients who uh, either have Alzheimer's disease, early stages, or mild cognitive impairment, and it was able to reverse um, the symptoms that they were having. And and was this a miracle drug? No, it was not a miracle drug. Why was it? So it was a program of treatment. It was a programmatic approach which included um, extensive lab testing to identify um, and subtype the different types of Alzheimer's disease. His thought is that there are multiple pathways to get to Alzheimer's disease. It all ends up as Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, deterioration in the uh, temporal lobes, which are the, um, in the hippocampus. Um, so what I have read from the Aben Clinics is that there really is a significantly different approach. Instead of bombarding the brain with drugs, mm -hmm. because the brain itself takes up so many calories, it takes up right. so much energy, which I had no idea about, mm -hmm. that it really, diet is a huge aspect yes. of brain health. It's, it's exactly, Stan. It's the, di the, the brain uses 20 to 30% of the calories in your diet. Oh my gosh. It's only 2% of your body weight, and so it's very hungry, and it just um, uses a tremendous amount of energy. Um, and so it's important what you feed it. So if you're feeding your brain good fuel, it's going to respond well. If you feed it um, 
junk, it's going to not work well. And so what Dr. Bredesen uh, found that this was a key piece to helping patients improve. I want to get back to uh, Alzheimer's in, in just a minute because uh, it's, especially when it seems to be diabetes of the brain or diabetes type 3 as it's being called today mm -hmm. and we have mm -hmm. to get into insulin resistance as well. But I want to stay on diet for right now. Okay. Uh, what I have seen, the research that I have done for this show, is that water is the number one thing that people need for the brain. Is that right? Just mm -hmm. water? No, you need more than water, but that is an important element. Um, and, and the brain is six, up to 60 to 70 percent fat. And so, um, uh, but it, the rest is mostly water. Yeah, so, it needs so I get to eat bacon all the time? <laughs> hey, I'm ready for that. Actually, uh, there's a type of diet um, which is, is very healing for the brain called the ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. which is up to 70 to 75% fat. And as part of that diet, you couldn't eat all bacon, but you could eat some bacon and, and be in um, a state of nutritional Well, actually, I, I understand that, that two of the top fat sources are salmon and avocados. Right, exactly. Those are very helpful for the brain because they, um, the salmon contains omega-3 fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory. Um, so with any brain disease, we're always concerned about decreasing inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, avocados are a saturated fat, um, but it's the good kind because it's a vegetable source. And it's, uh, good Does it matter brain. if it's wild salmon versus farm-caught salmon or mm -hmm. organic avocados versus you know, chemically laced or That's a great question. Um, the farmed versus wild is, is, is true. Like you shouldn't ever eat farmed uh, salmon. It's, it's basically a, a toxin. Um, the, the farm salmon are grown in um, uh, pools where they're um, fed feed that um, is, is nutritionally deficient. They tend to be toxic. They're high in PCBs typically. Mm. Um, whereas wild salmon are much lower in toxins. They say anyway, stay organic. Stay organic. The avocados, um, the Environmental Working Group has a great uh, list of foods which are more important to eat organic versus not um, the dirty dozen uh, versus the clean 15. Uh, and so it's best to... All right, and we're going to get that up on the screen, the dirty dozen <laughs> 15, just so that you can have that as a reference. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other uh, foods that I was surprised was eggs. Eggs are actually good for you, eggs not just good. egg whites, but the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. Why the, is that? Well, the eggs, uh, the yolks in particular are where the nutrition are because that's what turns into the body of the chicken, whereas the feathers are the, the white. So really, the nutrition's in the yolk. Um, and there are molecules in the... Uh, egg, including lecithin, which is um, phosphatidylcholine, which is good for the cell membranes, very helpful for cell membranes. Uh, some of the others, which I would have expected, berries, mm -hmm. uh, nuts and seeds, uh, let's mm -hmm. see, broccoli, of course, uh, and mm -hmm. spinach. Yeah, there's some really cool studies on berries that have um, been shown to help and improve memory uh, in older adults. It goes right to the brain. Goes right to the brain, yeah, antioxidant rich. Uh, blueberries, raspberries, and those are more important to eat organic as well. And the, again, that is because of toxins. Toxins, yep, they absorb them. Uh, and then some spices, one in particular was saffron. Mm -hmm. I, I had no idea that saffron was, was so good for me. I know, saffron, it's, um, it's, it's shown, been shown to help with the brain as far as aging brain, but also helps with mood. Um, there's a number of studies on saffron and depression actually, and there's even one showing that it can reverse some of the um, sexual side effects of Prozac, for example. Um, and so it's a really interesting, um, very expensive uh, spice. Hmm. Uh, and then, of course, you will make everybody smile by telling them that it is good for your brain to eat dark chocolate. That's right, yeah. Antioxidant rich. It's like a health food. So you're taking your daily dose of, of dark chocolate. Um, the higher the cacao percentage, the more antioxidant, the less sugar is better. So why is this overall really good food for your, your brain? You, you wouldn't just mm, tell me to eat one right. thing just because of one part of my body, would you? Right. That's a good point. We, we, we don't want to forget the body uh, for the brain. Um, typically what we do for cardiovascular disease is often helpful for brain because your, your heart is a very um, metabolically active organ as well and needs, so, so many of the uh, uh, research supplements, for example, and dietary strategies are helpful for both. Um, for example, 
you know, the ketogenic diet and exercise is helpful for both heart and brain. So absolutely, these, these recommendations, if it's good for the brain, it's going to be good. What does exercise do for my brain? So and, and what yeah. is exercise for the brain? Do I have to go mm. out and do crossword puzzles? Well, that's a good point. Brain exercise, but physical exercise um, is, is very helpful for the brain. You, we're made to move. And so, you know, um, it increases blood flow. And if you have an overactive brain, it can calm down and, and flush out the adrenaline and cortisol and the stress hormones. Uh, it can help you think more clearly. Um, and there are supplements that increase BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, but nothing trumps it like exercise. It trumps them all. So, Something I haven't heard you mention, though, about being good for the, the brain are, are grains, whole grains, mm -hmm. um, and glutens. Mm -hmm. Why not? Yeah, it's, it seems puzzling, doesn't it? That, why wouldn't gluten be uh, helpful? Um, you know, gluten of today is not like gluten of 100 years ago. It's been deaminated to make it more sticky, um, so you can make fluffy uh, pastries and things, but that makes it sticky or irritating to the gut lining of most people. So, mm -hmm. so um, it can have an immune reaction in the gut, which if there's inflammation in the gut, often there's inflammation in the brain as well. I would recommend, um, especially if you have any difficulties, I would recommend most people have less grains, especially gluten. Um, and if you've never tried eliminating gluten and challenging, that's the best way to tell, is eliminate it for 30 days and then have some again and see if you all of a sudden have difficulty with gut pain or have fogginess. It's one of the most fatigue producing uh, grains or foods that I've come across. Okay. Let's go back to Alzheimer's because we talked before about it being called diabetes type three mm -hmm. or diabetes of the brain. Is that accurate? That's accurate. So it's one of the um, causes of Alzheimer's and it's, you know, you, as we talked about your brain has seen so much nutrition and so much fuel and insulin is basically uh, signaling to take in glucose. And so if, if that signal is damaged, the brain doesn't get glucose and that's insulin resistance, which happens in the body too, but in the brain it's devastating. How does it work? How does insulin work? Mm -hmm. um, so in, in relation to the brain. In relation, in relation to the brain. So um, the glucose transporter is damaged uh, often in Alzheimer's and um, Basically, the cells just become resistant to insulin, and so um, they they begin to uh, die, and uh, they be, they're very low in, in their um, energy level. They just can't function, uh, basically. And so, some of the dietary strategies are to to help, like the ketogenic diet, is to shift over from uh, burning glucose for fuel to mm -hmm. burning fats for fuel. And um, the body, the brain, is a hybrid organ, kind of like a a Prius. And so you've got, um, uh, you can burn glucose and the brain will love to burn glucose, preferably. But if there's no glucose around, then the brain shifts over and your body, the body shifts over to producing uh, fuel out of fatty acids. It'll break down fatty acids in your diet and, and make an energy source called ketones. That's why it's called ketogenic. Anytime you talk about a diet, uh, you know, today, and anytime you talk about glucose, you've got to talk about sugar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's natural sugars and then there are there's, there are processed sugars. What does that have to do with your brain? Are sugars bad for your brain? Uh, sugars are certainly bad for the brain, yeah. Um, sugar is an addictive, it's a drug-like substance, basically. Um, and So if I eat a lot of cake, I'm going to need to eat more cake. Right, right. You may, um, especially if you eat it early in the day. That's what I found with people. If you ha if you start your day with anything sweet, you're going to kind of want it the rest of the day. Um, and and why, one of the um, reasons I think sugar is not a good thing for the brain is that if you have um, it affects the blood sugar. So the blood sugar spikes, the insulin comes on board, the blood sugar then drops, and you feel these patterns of uh, blood sugar fluctuations, um, which our focus, our mood also fluctuates. So stable blood sugar equals stable focus and stable mood. And if you bring sugar into the equation, that destabilizes that energy. How does all this relate, if it does, to insulin resistance? Yeah, so you, you, you have these spikes and drops, and eventually um, 
the body becomes resistant because there's so much insulin being pumped out, it kind of becomes calloused. Like the cells become calloused to uh, the insulin and that's, then the insulin goes up. And you can measure this and predict it happening by measuring fasting insulin as part of your annual exam. Fasting insulin. Fasting insulin. That sounds so. like something religious. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you take the insulin test when you're um, after an overnight fast. Mm -hmm. Just a 12-hour fast is all. And um, hemoglobin A1C, which is um, average blood sugar over the past three months, and then fasting insulin tells us if you're starting to get that insulin resistance. I have read that it's, it's good for your metabolism to eat often to mm -hmm. have five meals a day instead of three, uh, or to in between meals to have carrots and celery so that you keep your metabolism going. Mm -hmm. But what I'm hearing and reading is that it might be better for your body and that it is better for your body mm -hmm. to instead not eat between meals. That's true, it's coming out as a new strategy. Um, and I, it's, first off, I'll just say it should be individualized. You know, younger people, kids, adolescents, teenagers, they, they have a higher need for, uh, they have a higher metabolism. And so um, eating frequently can be helpful. As again, it's that brain energy thing. We're trying to keep it stable. Mm -hmm. So it's a good strategy. But some folks get too much nutrition in, um, in the form of maybe sugar or carbohydrates. Um, and so actually having periods where you don't eat, say 12 hours, 16 hours of fasting called intermittent fasting, um, helps the insulin uh, reset. And so, so my elementary school kid, would have breakfast at 7.15, mm -hmm. uh, go and have a snack at school at 10.30, go have lunch at noon, come home at 3, have a snack before homework or play, then have dinner at 6, and then have a snack before bed at 8. Mm -hmm. Is all that necessary? Or Sounds is it like bad? my kids. <laughs> they eat all normal, the time. Normal kids. Normal kids, yeah. Um, I think that's normal and healthy. Um, I think as long as it's, they're not eating a lot of sugary things, I think that's okay uh, for kids. Well, what, what should they eat? Should they eat berries and nuts and seeds and things well, like that? They can't have ice cream? They, they uh, occasionally, it's fine. Um, I would say they should have protein and uh, at, at each meal and snack if possible. Eggs, salmon, avocados. Eggs, salmon, nuts are a great oh. snack for kids. Hummus and carrot sticks um, if they like. Um, you know, olives and things, some, some fats will help stabilize their um, blood sugar a little bit more too. And now let's talk about adults and, and you talked about the potential to reverse Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, that's what people are gonna hear. Can people actually have that much control through diet and exercise? It's very difficult to do, but it is possible. Um, can't you just do it with drugs instead? You can't, no, you can't, drugs don't do it because um, we, need to, we need to quench inflammation, we need to decrease that blood sugar and that insulin resistance problem. Um, we have to identify deficiencies, and including hormonal deficiencies, potential toxin, toxicity, and those need to be removed. Uh, Dr. Bredesen talks about a roof with 36 holes is like Alzheimer's, and so one of the holes is drugs, and those can be helpful at improving symptoms, but they're not going to slow this progression because Alzheimer's is a slow progression that starts 30 to 50 years before symptoms ever occur. With imaging, we can detect uh, changes five to nine years before symptoms occur. So that's one reason people come in and, and image their brains. Um, but once you've noticed changes, any symptoms, you have about 10 years or so to really start on a program, uh, which is really a healthy living program, but it's, it's intensive for people if they're not used to exercising and eating mm -hmm. well. We have an aging population in the United States as well as all around the world. At what age is it too late to start to try to get control back of your brain health? Well, if we're talking Alzheimer's, it, you know, later stages can't be reversed. So I, I, I want to spe uh, specify that. But it's never too late to change your brain. Your brain's always changing. We used to think that it was sort of uh, cut in stone and we're slowly chipping away. But the brain is always changing up until the day we die. And so there's always an opportunity for neuroplasticity, and which means um, basically that you can uh, modify how the uh, neurons are connecting and firing and, and can change. And so that's why I think as you age, you know, a lot of folks have earned their well-deserved de retirement. Mm -hmm. It's time to relax and chill, but it's important to keep the brain active. Um, 
through novelty, whether it's uh, learning a language, picking up an instrument, and not that it's um, that you're going to become an expert or perform, but that you're just um, exercising the brain and challenging it. So things like crossword puzzles and, yeah. you know, yeah, there's a game called Lamosity that I've played before that was actually pretty fun. It's pretty Brain cool. games. Exactly, yeah. Um, all of those are good, and I would think about it as um, cross-training. Like you would in the gym, you wouldn't just go work out your biceps and uh, minimize your legs. You would do a full-body workout. And so if someone's good at crossword, you don't want to just do crossword and stick with that. You want to try some brain games on the computer um, as part of a program. Mm -hmm. The Amen Clinic itself, there's lots of resources that seem to be available. The things we've talked about today, it seems like times a thousand is available, mm -hmm. like resources and books and things of that nature. Is, is it, can you get them straight from the clinic itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we provide a lot of resources, including coaching, because um, it's, it's hard to make the shift. So oftentimes having a, a family member help, um, uh, coaching is helpful. Um, but I also refer out for services too, like the exercise program. I say, so, you know, start with your gym, use a trainer, um, sign up for some classes. Scheduling is one of the biggest things with exercise, just scheduling it in. It in. Um, but we are the best place to start as far as creating that program, you know, assessing the brain and where someone's at, and then um, starting with the basic core piece and then adding pieces in if needed, because there are a lot of options now at, if we need to really give a boost to um, brain activity or brain health. We have about 30 seconds left. So if you were to look ahead five years in terms of brain research, where are we going to be? Thinking ahead for brain research, I think we're going to find that devices um, that help modify uh, brain activity um, it, it are, is certainly on the horizon. So um, we're going to map the brain and understand more uh, intricately how it, it's working um, and then we're going to be able to figure out some devices either electrical or magnetic um, that are just going to be more sophisticated that match up with the testing to really improve outcomes for people that are suffering. Okay. Excellent. So there you have it. It really does seem like better brain health, your better brain health is largely up to you. Dr. Chappick, thank you very much. My pleasure.